What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another FNAF story breakdown. In Lally's game, every single story seems to revolve around the central theme of a mystery. Under Construction focuses on a world that over time appears to be less and less real. Lally's game is a dive into Cade's history and the mystery of who is responsible for what and how. And the story we are covering today is no exception to these rules. So let's see if we can gather some information about the identity of our protagonist with some hidden details that you missed in Frailty. The story opens up into a scene that honestly just feels like a movie intro. Perhaps it feels like that because right away we are introduced to a shadowy figure that is actually a red herring villain. You see, this is beautifully written because it seems like the person has malicious intent while holding the knife at first, but then they actually end up saving the child. Notice how we are actually next to the cemetery here, which we later find out is where Jessica lives, essentially. So straight away, here's the thing that you probably clicked on this video for. What on earth is the deeper meaning behind to and fro? It's mentioned on four separate occasions in the entire story and never gets explained, never gets touched on again. Well, as much as you may hate it, I believe that Matt Pat was right with his theory on it. If you don't recall, Matt Pat said that Jessica is actually a scrapped staff bot. In this sense, Jessica would have some memories of mopping in the Mega Pizzaplex from the bots. This is why she remembers other things from her past, but can't quite put a finger on where these kind of memories come from, where the to and fro comes from. MatPat also said that Gregory could be similar, but we're not gonna to touch on that subject today. I don't believe that Jessica is fully a staff bot. I mean, we know that some of her scrap parts are like tin cans and scrapped car parts, uh, but I do believe that some of the metal scraps could be scrapped staff bots. Remember that in this story, there is an open mega pizzaplex. The story didn't even have to mention any pizza plex at all, but they did. And I think this is confirmation that something in Security Breach is related to this story. I think it could be something to do with the scrapped staff bots, and there's more evidence for this, which we will be getting onto later on. We get some lovely foreshadowing, and if you watch any of my other videos, you'll know I love foreshadowing in these books. A nursing assistant tells Nurse Macy that Jessica looks so frail and that it creeps him out with the way she lurks around. Then he says, it's not normal. She's obviously alive and yet she's not really living. This of course foreshadowing the fact that she may be living but not in the way that you may think. And adding on to this, it is mentioned that he tried asking her something but she just looked into empty space and blinked and sp like he spoke like an alien. When questions are directed to her, her responses are small and subtle. I don't know about you but this sounds suspiciously like a staff bot just programmed to do her job and not much else. It's only when she ends up wanting to live her own life again, when she breaks away from that kind of programming and ultimately sacrifices everything. Jessica makes a callback to the car crash we saw at the beginning and calls it a miracle that it happened near the cemetery. This parallels how the introductory section of the story ends with them also calling the event a miracle. We see Jessica in science and engineering class at West Wilson High School, and she gets called lots of interesting names. First, she is compared to a mannequin, which again, with the context of staff bots, makes a lot of sense. Someone mentions how she was spotted walking around the graveyard, so they call her zombie girl, dark witch, and the unwalking dead. No wait, the walking undead. The Walking Undead is obviously a play on The Walking Dead, which is a TV show about a zombie apocalypse. It's interesting that she is called out as being like a zombie because I actually believe that as a result of her past choices, she is in fact an undead creature, a person who supposedly died and was animated into what we know as Jessica once again. My voice just went, I'm sorry. And building on this whole idea, we learn that Jessica and Robert's task is to build a mini robot. And the way they end up doing that is by gathering scrap pieces of metal from the junkyard and putting them together into something completely functional. I'd say this side story is actually kind of a microcosm for the larger story itself. Jessica, as we learn later, is just like her mini robot. 
a functional being brought together with pieces of scrap metal from the junkyard. I guess you could also call this foreshadowing. As Jessica tucks herself up in her sleeping bag in the mausoleum, she brings out a chain with a white rabbit's foot. Now, in many cultures, rabbit's feet are used as amulets for good luck. However, in the story, Jessica no longer seems to believe in luck. The white rabbit's foot is apparently a reminder of who she used to be and who she would never be again. I absolutely hate the fact that this leaves the potential for her to be Vanny. Nope, I, I, am, I am not even touching that. Seriously though, I would love an explanation for this small forgettable detail. We get a moment that I personally find quite funny. Nurse Macy finds a piece of a car muffler, some rusty bolts and cans, and finds herself speaking to Father Jeremiah about who is playing these pranks. At one point she calls the person a prankster, which I'd say is a pretty big nod to the Fazbear Fright Story prankster, where the protagonist is also called Jeremiah. He then tells Nurse Macy to go easy on whoever the prankster is, because as I quote, everybody has a story that we don't yet know, which pretty much sums up the key themes of this story. Remember when I was talking about the minibot parallel before? It seems like Jessica definitely knows about this too. She says that robots aren't always original, sometimes they are just made from boring old junkyard scraps, and then she immediately feels a wave of sadness. Pairing this with the fact that she won't go to the junkyard and she doesn't like going near scrap metal, it's pretty clear that Jessica is completely aware of who she is and what really happened. Jessica is offered some brownies but doesn't want to take one because she doesn't feel like she deserves it. Strangely, I'm getting some weird vibes from Vanessa in the therapist tapes who doesn't take butterscotch candy because of the calorie content. Maybe she's being a bit hard on herself. I don't know, I'm not the therapist in this situation. Unlike Vanessa though, Jessica ends up taking the brownie and calls it heavenly. And this is where the bittersweet potential of life begins breaking through, begins leaking into her actual life. Of course, Robert asks her if he would like to go to the prom with her, and in the next scene, she panics as she realizes that her mission has been skewered by her life's desires. Oh my gosh, even more foreshadowing, and I love this one so much. I wanna read you the full quote because this is beautiful. This is when Jessica is in the chapel again, and, and she's realizing that she has messed up entirely. Please help me know what to do. Please guide me. I never thought this would happen. I had made a plan and now things have changed. I did my best to keep to myself and to do the right thing and now everything seems to be falling apart. Yeah, of course everything is falling apart. Quite literally. This is brilliant, oh my gosh. Father Jeremiah talks to her again and talks about how she needs to give herself as well as give, give to others in order to have some balance in her life. He has a sympathy for her and apparently knows from experience that he couldn't save everyone. I'm not sure if it was me who got some sort of energy from the story, but I have a strange suspicion that Father Jeremiah has dealt with funky issues like this before. Remember that he's the only one who knows what actually happened to Jessica at the end, so he might have pieced it together after finding the rusty gear on the floor. Next, we have a tearful scene that is really reminiscent of the real Jake actually. We find out that April has cancer in the blood and that she likes to imagine what sort of activity she would partake in if she wasn't diagnosed with cancer. This is similar to how Jake spoke to Simon about what the real Jake would have done every day. Eventually Simon lost his voice and Jake lost his hope from that. April asks Jessica to tell her what happens in her life as I feel like they could relate. Both are kind of young teenagers, April finds Jessica's face pretty, but she doesn't realize that behind her makeup, Jessica looks exactly the same as her, completely frail. Now nurse Macy sees Jessica staring into empty space and not moving at all, like she's in a trance or something. Again, more staff bot suspicions, I would say. And she offers to take Jessica to the department store for a dress because she feels that behind her, there is this deep sadness behind trauma that never goes away. Advice that she gives is actually to wear a brighter colour. It's mentioned a few times in the story that Jessica only wears black because it makes her feel less visible and means that less pe people approach her. Uh, Nurse Macy is very aware of this and decides it might be good to stand out at the prom with a brighter colour. 
This helps build on the overall theme of helping yourself rather than just keeping to yourself. Now, Nurse Macy feels a little bit guilty for searching through Jessica's work application and it is mentioned how she is violating HIPAA or H-I-P-A-A. -A. Uh, now, in case you are wondering what on earth this is, I was wondering what it was, it is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, which is a federal law that ensures that patients with sensitive information don't have it disclosed without the patient's consent and knowledge. Of course, what Macy is doing is wrong, even though she's doing it for the right reasons. And I guess you could say that Jessica is doing the same. We then turn back to Jessica in a nightmare. She's in an empty void, which to me feels a little reminiscent of the ending cutscene in Ultimate Custom Night. I'm not really sure why they would be related. I mean, how they could be related if they are, but that's just something to point out. She hears metal against metal and it chases her and tears her arms off. I missed this part of the story when I first read it, oh my gosh. It tries to pull the pendant off of her neck. The big question of course is what is this, who is this? It could of course be Eleanor. Uh, we know that she didn't die forever, she was only trapped in a bad memory. She has a relation to the pendant so it makes sense for her to take it back. But uh, whoever this is, I feel like it is the entity that set Jessica on this kind of mission to help people. Uh, the minute she starts to stray away from this mission, he, she has this nightmare to kind of scare her away from continuing with her normal life. Um, now, notice how she is actually in her prom dress during this nightmare. And that is because it's kind of showing a potential outcome of the future events, which kind of ends up happening. And finally, we get to the good part, Jessica and Robert are dancing at prom together and I think that this entire scene is written absolutely perfectly. Honestly, during the slow dance everything is explained vividly and because it talks about every little detail it takes longer to read which in turn makes it slower. But the second the incident happens everything contrasts immediately into a wild messy panic and it is written exactly how it wants you to feel. Change of pace and tone is so abrupt that it builds up a sense of happiness for Jessica and then quickly drops it with confusion. This leads her to run out into the cold night, slip into April's room and sacrifice her life for April's. This story is wonderfully written. It is mind blowing an exceptional beginning to the series. It sets such a high bar, honestly, for the rest of the, for the rest of the stories, all the other stories. If you have any other details that I missed, then make sure you let me know in the comments below. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Goodbye.